This podcast is sponsored by Bigger Brains, online training that won't bore you to tears. Expand the minds of your workforce at getbiggerbrains.com. Welcome to Permission to Speak, the video blog and podcast that loiters at the intersection of leaders who want their people to speak up, technology that facilitates connections, and results that serve our higher purpose. Now, here's your host, Kelly Vandiver. Hi, this is Kelly Vandiver. Welcome to the podcast. I am so excited today <laughs> to be talking to Ed Brill. Um, Ed is the Vice President of Social Business Cloud Services for IBM and led the team who deployed IBM Verse to make sure I, my math is right here, Ed, 456,000 IBMers in uh, nine months. That was so two weeks ago, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was like nine months that you did this in? Is yeah, that right? Yeah. Amazing, amazing. Okay. Yeah. And the mission of your team, which I loved, was to be your own best reference for IBM Verse. Okay. And and evidently you have uh, achieved that based on the, the thousands of positive comments you've got from fellow IBMers. Um, Ed is the author of the Amazon best-selling book, Opting In, Lessons in Social Business, and he regularly blogs at edbrill.com. Um, I do want to point out that the views Ed expresses will be his own and don't necessarily represent IBM's position, strategies, or opinions. So welcome, Ed. Thank you. <laughs> so happy to have you. Um, now, part of our... <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Uh, part of our process here is to ask you a couple of quirky questions to get to know you a little better before we uh, dive into the to the rich content to share today. So my uh, first quirky question is, what is your favorite possession? So I'm going to go a little off um, off topic. I'm going to say my passport is my favorite possession. <laughs> It lets me explore the world. I've um, visited 65 countries and um, about half of that in the context of my work and about the other half just because I could go there. Um, there's still a lot of the world left to explore, but I, I love the sort of you know notion that we're all connected and that I can show up in any random city in the world and I probably know some people. Very cool. Now, is that because of IBM or because you're just you just are connected to people uh, through your website and all that? I, I think the the community that ev uh, evolved around Lotus Notes when I was running the notes business um, it was very far flung, right? Customers in almost every major country. So um, and, and that built then my social presence, which led to things like this conversation today, and. So I think it's the combination of the two. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. And I have to tell you, I have a soft spot in my heart for Lotus Notes mm -hmm. because it was the very first um, email system that I ever used. And uh, when I transferred to a new company and they were moving to Lotus Notes, I'm like, You're, this is great. Believe me, it's better than what we have. So <laughs> I'm not... And I'm not, <laughs> and, I, and I'm not just sucking up. I, I, Fair, I, enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh. All right. All right, second quirky question. Uh, tell us something surprising about yourself that most people don't know. Yeah, so um, I usually answer this kind of a question with, um, I played for Bobby Knight. Um, and everybody goes, wait, what? The basketball coach, Bobby <laughs> yeah, Knight. Yeah, the basketball coach. Yeah, I played for <laughs> Bobby Knight. Um, I played clarinet in the pep band. <laughs> and, uh, during a TV timeout, one game, he came over and conducted the pep band in the fight song. So I played for Bobby Knight. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> very cool, very cool. All righty. And now for, for a little more seriousness. Yes, yeah, so of course. <laughs> okay. Um, so what is your story? What got you to the point where you felt like uh, people need to, uh, we need to care about folks, we need people to speak up, we need people to connect and engage? Yeah, so I came into what was Lotus and then acquired by IBM um, a long time ago in, in 1994. And uh, I had been sort of early days of um, internet chats and um, TCP IP networking in general and bulletin boards and all that. And so I sort of had this sense of computers could connect people to people uh, innately within me from my limited work and, and online experience before I came to Lotus. And when I came into Lotus, I found that I was sitting there close to customers as a field engineer and had some sense of what they wanted in the products and from us as a company and um, was working with their partners. 
And the, the people back at corporate didn't <laughs> necessarily know, you know, what was going on in the field. And I found that there were discussion forums and ways of, you know, sharing knowledge from the field. And I, I felt engaged that way. Um, so that when I eventually decided career wise, I wanted to be on the other side of that equation and be a brand manager. Um, I kept those connections going. And as soon as social networking became real, um, you know, beyond the realm of Usenet or chat boards or whatever, um, I kind of got kicked into the direction of, you know, you should probably write a blog um, in, in 2004, I think, or maybe it was even late 2003. Um, by a friend of mine, Volker Reber, and he said, you know, you, you write well, you probably could do this. And at first I just wrote about anything because that's what we all did. <laughs> but eventually I found an audience in talking about the business that I was part of and in, in talking about notes. And um, it changed the way that we ran the business because we were able to talk to customers and, and partners directly and even competitors. Um, and uh, we could control the conversation and we could find out what was really happening um, and, and get real-time feedback and not w wait for focus groups and market studies and um, escalations and favorite <laughs> customer of the week and management by last customer visited. Um, it was real and it was aggregated and it was the voice of the customer and I, I got hooked very, very quickly. So was that while before, you, uh, before IBM acquired Lotus that you started doing the blogging or was it after? No, so IBM acquired Lotus way back in 1995, but left us separate till 2001. I didn't really start blogging till 2004. So I was in these other forums and online communities before then, but um, the blogging's more recent. Okay. And so you are, all, uh, because you were already with IBM and they're kind of a conservative company or the perception was, um, what gave you uh, the chutzpah <laughs> to, to, to start doing that? And, and how did that kind of evolve? So um, around the same time that social networking first started, um, uh, it was kind of, uh, you know, Wild West to use the Americanism, right? You know, we all kind of were figuring it out on our own. Um, but a group of us who had started blogging got together under um, the direction of a guy named David Berger, who's with IBM again. He had left for a while, but he's back. And David was like, you know, we need to write some guidelines up. Not bad guidelines, not evil guidelines. Let's just figure <laughs> out what the right thing is to say to people about what social networking should be a a around. And we called them the blogging guidelines, and we wrote them together in a wiki as a group without HR, without legal, without finance. And we just said, this is a logical policy document. And when we were done with it, then we went to HR and legal and finance and said, what do you think? And they said, oh, this is actually really good. And I think today, even it's now a decade later, that document stands as the, you know, sort of proof over time. It's the most empowering document I've ever seen at IBM. It says, we want you to do this. If you do it this way, you're all good. Mm -hmm. And so that really was the way that we got off the ground was experimentation and then putting together some kind of uh, guidance, uh, you know, uh, some, some form of compliance or whatever term you want to use um, that was able to be socialized within the company. And I, I think it's still a, a good example and other companies model it. Um, even today, 10 years later. Yeah, I, lo I loved when you talked about that in your book, and <laughs> I, I was amazed that you did it without HR and without legal, but I think that was brilliant, that, that the people that were involved in it created it. Yep, and, and it worked. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Now, um, you when we were uh, corresponding, uh, uh, getting ready for this interview, you had mentioned uh, that you had a story, something about backstabbing or something. Uh, so can, can you uh, fill us in on, on that and how that impacts yeah. kind of where you went in your career, in your life? Yeah, and I actually posted a little bit about this in response to a LinkedIn blog the other day um, from the HR, the person who is the HR vice president at the company where this took place. So I was at US Robotics before I came to IBM. Um, they were ma making modems and you know, sort of growing explosively. It had just gone public. And the company was growing fast. It was like 300 employees when I joined in 1992. And by the time I left in 1994, it was 1,200 and growing to 2,500. Anyway, very, very fast growth company. And so uh, a lot of young people and a lot of um, maybe not so much business savvy. And uh, I ended up in a, a position for a while where the manager of our department, and I was in IT there, the manager of our department left. And for a couple of months while they were waiting to backfill, they asked me to 
coordinate the activities of the team that I was on. <coughs> Pardon me. And um, so at the ripe young age of 23 or whatever it was at the time, um, here I was trying to tell this group of eight guys, you know, here's what we have to work on this week because these are the help desk tickets and these are the projects. And I guess I didn't really have a sense, but I was creating resentment, right? Because this young kid was telling these guys what to do. And uh, the minute the new manager came in, I happened to miss a meeting, a uh, staff meeting, and I guess it turned into the Ed Brill roasting session. And, and they, they really went after the brand new manager of what a jerk I was and how I wasn't a team player and, 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 and. And, you know, a lot of people sort of, you know, dwell on things in their past. And I really try not to, but this one thing from my past um, it was a really defining moment for me because it made me realize that, you know, I was handed a job and I certainly was capable of doing it, but I never really made sure to make the effort to create a team and co the cohesion that was needed and the social dynamic of having all voices respected and everybody's point of view being important and expressing gratitude, right? I just didn't know how to do that in the business sense. I just thought I was doing my job by making sure these tasks got done and I did none of the human relations that were around it. So I feel like ever since then that social has given me an ability to do all those things that I didn't know how to do in 1994 or whenever that was. Um, so I make sure, like we just finished the verse rollout, I sent a thank you note to 200 people. I wrote on their internal walls, on their, their profiles for like 30 of them, special accolades. Um, not just because it was the right thing to do, but because generally these are the people that made the project work, not me, right? right. I, I just told them what to do. So um, I think that sort of that leadership lesson is, is something that, that has stuck with me. And it, it certainly at the time didn't feel like a lesson or anything fun, but it has, has really kept me focused on um, what social should be about and how people should work with people. Well, that's that, that's a great story, and the fact that you did learn that lesson, <laughs> as opposed to they're just jerks, you know, <laughs> uh, you know what, what what role did I play in it, and how how can I learn from that? And and I did notice in your writing when you uh, when you posted about the verse rollout and how well things were going that you you always talked about your team. You you made yeah. sure to to give them credit. So I, I'm curious. Um, because you're talking about listening to people's voices, how did you do that as you were as you were preparing to roll out verse? How how did that collaboration go? So, when the pro when the project started, I took over on uh, March sixth of last year, and the 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 shipping version of verse was coming on March thirty first. So there was basically three weeks between when I took over the project and and when it was going to get started. And the chairman of the company had basically promised all employees they would get verse right away. Um, it was important for us to, you know, drink our own champagne or whatever phrase, uh, be our own best reference. <laughs> and um, it had already been promised to them. So we didn't have a lot of time to figure this out. Um, and uh, I, I have a marketing and, and product background. And so I came into the IT organization with that orientation. So in the meeting where we were trying to figure out how we were going to get started, um, I was there with the director of internal communications, and we just realized that we needed to do what she normally does, employee engagement, in order to make this rollout successful. And that was a very different approach than the typical IT rollout. Um, so we designed an early adopters group and a white glove service for executives and um, a set of community forums where we could talk to IBMers about their experience as they go. And, and it turned into a support forum. Um, again, not a new idea, but in this context, it had never been done before. So I was able to hear the voice of every IBMer as they went through the process of converting to the new mail system, no matter where they were in the world or what department or whatever, we just had a direct hardwired environment. And I think that that was what made the project successful, was our initial decision to think of it more of as an employee engagement campaign than an IT migration or rollout. Excellent, excellent. And um, your results, I, I was reading in your blog, The uh, you want to tell them how many steps it originally started with and how many steps you got it down to? Yeah, I think the initial instructions that, that I inherited were like 11 steps. Uh, click here, generate this password, wait 24 hours, register on this site. It was super complicated. And, um, you know, we're big believers in Agile at IBM, and we iterated. We threw, you know, good ideas into the backlog. And by about six weeks in, we had it down to about four steps, um, you know, instead of 11. 
And there was even a pilot project in, in Asia where a couple of the countries um, went with one automated button that they just clicked the button and almost everything else happened. So, you know, we knew how to take the complexity out, but we had to get started. And that's one of the key lessons is, you know, we could have waited for that perfection. It would have taken us four months. And in the meantime, you know, we moved 100,000 mailboxes. Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to refer back to my list of perfect. questions here because there was, there was uh, a lot you, uh, a lot to talk about now. Um, uh, and, and one other point I want to um, make so you can brag about it a little bit is uh, tell them what your defect rate was by the time you got to Japan. So in Japan, um, admittedly not a complicated environment because just one country, um, but they have about 33,000 mailboxes in Japan and the defect rate there was 0.01%. In other words, I think they had about 18 defects out of 30,000. Um, we certainly didn't start there, but uh, the <laughs> The Japanese team did an amazing job of prep work and upfront, um, you know, sort of hygiene to make sure that by the time we actually pushed a mailbox from point A to point B, that it was ready to go. So you didn't start out perfect, but eventually you almost got there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so you talk about uh, transparency um, in the rollout and being up front with your IBMers. You talk about transparency in your book. Um, uh, there's an example that you gave um, uh, about installing Lotus on your um, Mac, <laughs> yeah. which I thought was really interesting. <laughs> um, and, and you were very transparent online about some challenges you had with that. Um, so, so maybe you could, um, uh, what I'm curious about in your experience, being transparent like that um, in these different ways, um, what that has gained you? you? You mentioned that there was more trust and, and um, engagement that was gained. So can you tell us about um, what that looked like and, and especially maybe to encourage uh, leaders who are a little more hesitant about being transparent about the benefit that can come along with that? Yeah, I, I, I think transparency is the thing that I believe in the most. Um, in, in my day-to-day -day work because um, if you can't be straight with people, then they don't know how to get behind a mission. They don't know what their individual contributions should be. And they don't know what the climate is in terms of risk-taking or you know, even just accomplishing tasks on any given day. So yeah, so I have, I have tried very hard to live fairly transparently um, in, in my business environment. You know, not everything. Um, there are days when I feel like I should push the envelope even more. Um, but I work in a company of 400,000 people, right? And so there are certain things you can't be transparent about. Um, and, you know, some of those uh, are, you know, at the end of the spectrum of orange jumpsuits and SEC violations, right? So I got to <laughs> stay away from transparency there. Um, but, you know, the, the blog entry is a great example, right? I got my very first Mac um, laptop and I went to install notes on it and it didn't work. And I was like, come on, this is my own product. I've worked on this thing forever. I know this product, so you can't blame the user. It's not a headspace error or whatever. <laughs> I do know what I'm doing, and I can't install it. And, you know, we sure fix those problems really, really fast, right? Um, in the case of the Verse rollout, there was a, a day in May where we were just dying. And... Um, you know, the, we had boarded a group of salespeople right when they were going to a sales meeting and uh, we weren't supposed to be. Um, and so they were lined up in the halls at the sales meeting to go talk to the on-site on IT people about the problems they were having with getting diverse. And I expected to go into the next project meeting and be told, all right, stop. You know, you guys are having too many problems. You know, you got to go, um, you know, reset your plan. And instead, I went into that project meeting and I was told, go faster. And <laughs> <laughs> it didn't really make a lot of sense, but it, it, you know, once you distilled it out, it made sense. The transparency point was the faster we went, the more we uncovered the problems, right? They weren't hiding in little deep, dark corners of IBM. They were right there in our face and nobody could pretend that they weren't problems. So by getting them hitting the wall over and over from May and June and July, you know, by the time we got to October, there, there were no problems, right? We had hit them all already. And um, so I felt like, you know, having that opportunity to tell IBMers, look, it's going to be ugly here for a little while. We even in, uh, enrolled a bunch of early adopters up front and said, you know, this roller coaster hasn't been tested yet, but if you want to be one of the first riders, 
You know, you might fall off, but you, you're going to be done. You're going to be the first to experience it. Um, and I, I, that was the expectation we set, and that was how we got it done. So I think, um, you know, being straight with people is, is, is the best way to get things done. Yeah, this is going to be painful, but, you know, look at what's going to happen at the other end. And I think people will, will get on board for a mission like that. So with whether it, it's that Lotus example or just the verse example that you're, you're just giving us, um, when, you're, when you're going back to a team and you're saying, this did not work, this is not what we need to do, and, and you're being very public about it, um, how do you keep it from getting so that the team gets, feels beat up or demoralized in, in that kind of a situation? Yeah, so this, is, this has been an interesting um, challenge. You know, I like to say that at IBM, you know, we're the world's best technology company. So we also happen to have over 400,000 CIOs in the company. So <laughs> sort of thinks that they, they know what they're doing, right? Um, and, and our IT department has a history of acting defensively as a result. They sort of feel like, you know, they're going to screw up no matter what. So, you know, we, 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 we better not do anything, right? Um, and with this project, we didn't have a choice because we had to get the project done and the chairman was demanding it. So, you know, basically I took it all on, on, on my own. You know, if there were problems, they were my problems. They weren't my team's problems, they were mine. Um, and I made sure to highlight the positives. So even in the, the absolute worst, darkest days, um, I have a storyteller on my team. I think you've met her, Lauren Maxwell. Right. And I had her go collect the anecdotes from IBMers where they said, you know, I had a great experience. And we made sure to put that presentation front and center in the community so the team could see it, so the people who hadn't yet moved on onto Verse could see it. Um, I think, you know, you have to tell the good stories because that's how people can envision the future. And uh, so I don't feel like our team got very demoralized. I did lose one person on the team who felt like they just were working too hard and couldn't take it anymore. So it, it does happen. Um, but, uh, the rest of the team, I think they felt like they were, you know, at the bottom of it at one point and they kind of could see that the other end was going to be better because they could see we were iterating and improving and we just had to stay focused on that. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Um, so uh, I know IBM has, has worked hard to be more open, to be more collaborative. Um, but I'm curious about those middle managers. Um, uh, when when folks are talking to their boss's boss's boss and 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 having come from a more of a hierarchical kind of uh, history, um, what kind of tips might you give them about moving from a, a hierarch other other leaders other managers uh, moving from a hierarchical kind of an organization one that's trying to be more open trying to be more transparent what what tips might you give those those uh, leaders Yeah, and and we definitely still have plenty of command and control and people who want to work that way. And, and, and that's fine. And you have to sort of respect that and understand, you know, where do people's work styles lie. But I think that, you know, if you can encourage, especially at the brainstorming phase of, of, of any problem, you know, getting people to contribute their ideas, then the execution, even if it's ultimately a management decision, um, you've gotten people to at least get their ideas on the table and they feel like they were part of the process. So, you know, I'm planning a team meeting for next week, and I, I, one of my team just asked me, well, in this time slot on Wednesday, what are you planning to talk about? And I said, uh, I'm not. I'm planning to talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. So um, I think there's still a lot of people who expect to be told what to do, which is, you know, fine. You ultimately have to have that in any company, but you can do it in a, in a collaborative work style that says, but I want to hear everybody's opinions first, and I want to socialize that and get it to a point where we have a consensus um, you know, that happens through transparency. That happens through putting your thoughts out there as just equal ideas with anybody else, as opposed to saying, hey, I'm in charge here and this is what's going to happen. Right. Now, so w in what ways do you actually do that? So if you think about maybe a, a something related to verse or, 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 you know, how does that conversation start? How do you um, keep from being everybody looking to you to, to have the answers? Um, I guess, you know, it's a tried and true management tactic, but, you know, what's working well, team, tell me what's working well, um, what's not working so well, and what are your ideas on how to fix that, right? And you just turn the table back around. Um, my job at that point is to coach and provide experience and insight, right? And that's really how I've always looked at my job as a manager, 
is you know player coach, not as dictator in charge. Um, and so if I can get everybody to surface their ideas, some of them won't be very good, but some of them will be awesome, and there'll certainly be things I've never thought of. But then it's my job to then connect those dots with, okay, I know about this initiative over here and this budget over here, and how do we put those together and, and make it work? So I really try to give people a voice. Very cool. Very cool. Um, I, I'm always amazed at how smart some of the people are that have been on my teams in the past. <laughs> they, they know this stuff better than I do. And, and in the very first review I conducted with some of our architects about the plan to move like uh, people's um, profiles from our premises environment to the cloud, um, they finished up and they said, well, who else do we have to review this with? And I said, you're done. Right. I mean, you guys, are the experts, you're telling me you think that this is what you should do. It seems to pass my sniff test. Go do it. You don't need to tell anybody else. But they're so used to command and control that they expected there to be three more levels of review. Um, and I've had the, the fortunate opportunity for the last year to work for our CIO, Jeff Smith. You know, he doesn't want to get into the details, right? He's a visionary strategist kind of guy. So he, he could care less what, what my decisions are if my project is getting done. He's not going to inspect it. So the, that empowerment at multiple levels is really, really important. And so do they believe you now when you say, really, <laughs> I, want, I want you to, uh, mm. to, to voice it and say it? Sometimes yes and sometimes no. Um, we'll see how my team meeting goes next week. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it still comes back to the four hundred thousand CIOs. They're just hesitant to to make a misstep. So, gotcha, gotcha. All right. Um, so, if it, so let's so let's say an organization kind of changing, shifting gears here a little bit. Say an organization comes to you um, at, at IBM and says you want to be more. They want to be more social. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe because they're hearing everybody else is doing it, so I need to get on board. But what are some of the cultural type of must-haves that an organization needs to to be ready for a more open, more social environment? So I think there's probably two things worth highlighting. One is that you have to have objectives and outcomes in mind, right? This can't just be holding hands and sharing files. There's got to actually be something that you're looking for out of the participation in social that's going to be different than the way that you work today. So defining those, uh, those objectives and what the expected outcomes are, um, which can be a group exercise and gets everybody bought in, is really a, a, a great place to start. Um, and the second is you have to have um, lead by example leaders, right? You have to have, it doesn't have to be the people at the top of the pyramid necessarily, but you have to have people who are going to pace that, who are going to show exactly the way it should be done and what the results can be of doing so. And um, at IBM, what we did when we really wanted to get our accelerated uh, transformation going was we put in place a, a reverse mentoring program, a coaching program for senior executives who said, I don't know how to do social. So we designed them some, you know, hotshot new employee, typically millennial, um, and say, here, you know, this person's going to teach you how. And those execs that were in our coaching program had six times as much helpful content as measured by likes and comments and things like that as those that were not coached. So we were able to show that coaching has a material benefit on the participation. Excellent. Um, I, I, I've, I've been hearing a lot about reverse mentoring, but I, it's, it's cool to hear that at, at an IBM. Yeah, <laughs> Very cool. Um, so there's something that you said, I'm trying to... Um, uh, something you said, but I was listening, so I, <laughs> I didn't write something down, so I would <laughs> capture it. Um, Okay, so you talked about the organizations and and what and what they have to have. Um, oh, um, when uh, so you've got like something like reverse mentoring, people are, are get some attention from execs that they may never have interacted with, um, had it not been had you not asked them to to step up and do that. Um, and when you're talking about a social environment, um, because people are out there and and working out loud or or. Um, are more visible. Uh, what what are some of the benefits that you've seen uh, up and down the chain of command, if you will, um, with people being more visible or or recognized? Or does that happen? Or is that just no? It absolutely happens. I mean, I, I'm in the jobs I'm in because of my online social profile within IBM, right? I mean, I am one of our work at home employees, and so nobody sees me in an office day to day. Um, the only way that people in IBM know who I am is from my online pr presence, right? Or, you know, they've seen me speak at an event or something like that. 
Um, but so career progression or, um, you know, even more simply defining your eminence within the company is a, a great individual attribute of, of this kind of participation. Um, but it's also, you know, being IBM, it's, it's like the sense of belonging to the company is, is one of the things that comes through in our connections environment, our, our internal platform. No matter where you sit in the company, geography or department or level, um, it's kind of the one great unifier. And that has started from the top um, and trickles all the way down. So I think that there's a lot of benefits that people have seen from being active. Not everybody's going to. It's totally okay. There's different personalities and different roles where people are going to be lurkers or consumers of information. That's totally fine. You wouldn't want to walk into a party with everybody talking at once. Um, so, you know, you just have to see who's going to participate and who is, and they'll set the pace for the others. Very cool. Um, so, uh, so what would your advice be um, for employees, for leaders, as they're as they're getting in, if they were on IBM Connections and they were getting involved in in their organization's show, social and collaborative kind of um, um, work? What what would, what advice would you give folks um, as far as getting involved and how to get get going and 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 make it worth it? Uh, we were on a call with a client just the other night, and one of the top executives within IBM in terms of their social participation probably put it better than I, I could. She said, just don't be afraid to make mistakes. Right? I mean, that's the, the, the thing of you just have to get started, right? You can't wait for perfection. You can't assume that you're going to hire professional writers to write your content and make sure it's perfect and whatever. You just got to go and you got to find your sea legs as you go. Um, and I think that, that IBMers are forgiving of that in our environment. Um, they know that content is more important to have real time than it is to have perfect. And so I would just encourage people to experiment. Maybe it's, you know, initially you decide I'm going to just comment on other people's stuff and then eventually I'll start writing my own. Or I'm going to just do videos because I don't have the time to write or, you know, whatever it is. But decide your strategy and, and just go um, and, and don't wait for perfect. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so what have been some of your... Um, unexpected pleasant surprises in in this journey um, as as more people have kind of gotten what it is that you got pretty early on um, relatively speaking what have been some of your pleasant surprises along the way well I mean I think you know for for the company the fact that we got social as quickly as we did and did with when the external networks came about um, was not something I expected. We basically changed the culture of the company through social. When I joined IBM or when I think about IBM 20 years ago, it was a faceless conglomerate, right? I mean, we actually had almost a stated position that you had one person who talked to a customer and that was the, you know, the sales rep for that customer and everybody else was kind of behind the scenes, right? And instead, we've, you know, sort of mobilized this army where IBM is the biggest company on LinkedIn, for example. And, and our individual voices show the market that we have expertise in all these broad ranging topics. Um, so we really, really transformed from an environment where individual voices and brand names of people were not just um, not a good idea, but they were like expressly prohibited to one where we celebrate our people. And, and, and that's been fantastic. Um, I think on an individual level, um, the willingness of in individual people to get excited about um, technology and, and adoption uh, has also surprised me. We have a guy in Bratislava who is a finance guy, and on um, you know Wednesday afternoons he puts on a white lab coat and becomes Doctor Connections. <laughs> <laughs> and you know he's not paid to do that. It's not in his KPIs, but he just loves it so much that he does it. And, you know, I think it's fantastic, right? That, you know, people will give of their time um, when they feel an individual satisfaction or reward for it. And, and it's not always about money or job or whatever. It's just the right thing to do. So what does he do as Dr. Connections? Um, he does video tutorials and um, they're posted on our internet of, you know, what to do with the, the various technologies that are in Connections. That is that is super cool. That, that, that's the best kind of testimonial, right? They're doing it. He's doing it because he's passionate. He thinks it's very cool and wants other people to know it. Mm -hmm. 
Very cool. Um, and so one thing I'm curious about um, how it works at, at, at IBM, I, uh, when you read about uh, social environments and one of the benefits is you can find the experts you need uh, when you need them. Uh, does that does that really happen? <laughs> do do, do uh, people have projects that they're working on or pulling together and they are, um, are going out there and, and finding and tapping people and bringing them into projects or how does that work? Um, it probably doesn't happen as much as we would hope because it is just such a huge diverse company. But um, but we have a, an app called the Expertise Locator and it's on the desktop as well as on mobile. And I can type in some keywords about, you know, Watson Cognitive, Blue Mix, blah, blah, blah. And it'll it'll try to help me find those right people. So um, we're not to the to the level of maturity that that's like, hey, I spun up a project and tell me who my my project team members should be. That would be awesome. Um, but, you know, we definitely can, if a client is looking for information or expertise, we can usually find that right person. And the company that's the size of Miami in terms of population, you know, that's not always easy to find those people. So I think it's definitely helped us in terms of understanding the, the knowledge and capability of our employees. And, and are you finding... Um I've been hearing uh, and reading about people being overtaxed. Are you finding that as an issue at this point or, or not so much? That's a meme going around in the last couple of weeks. Like I've seen some you know, Facebook cartoon of, well, I'm glad I have social now because I only have 16 more places to check for stuff, right? Um, there is an element of that for sure. Um, you know, when we built the, uh, the verse email interface, it was sort of a waving the white flag of, you know, social channels are not going to be perfect for everything. Email still has a relevant place. Um, and I think that there's a fatigue, um, you know, to having to check lots and lots of things and, and feel like you're always responding to that big red circle on your iPhone that says, oh, you got six things to action on here. <laughs> um, and maybe that's just my ADD. But, um, I, you know, when we've, when we've done it the right way and given people the right tools around following and filtering and topics and hashtags and whatever, it can be done really, really effectively, but it is a learned process. The tools themselves are not there yet. Um, we're working on a lot of great stuff around cognitive so that uh, the most relevant information should be surfaced to you. I don't think we're quite there yet. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, that is the magic pill, I think, next, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Ed, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Before we, we sign off, is there anything that, uh, that you would like to touch on um, with regards to what you've learned in this process or, or additional advice you might have for the, the leaders and others that might be listening? Um, I mean, I think we've, we've covered you know, a lot of the key measures and, and, and uh, key ways to, to be successful. I think when I, when I talk to clients, um, the number one point I emphasize is just know what you're trying to get at. Uh, know what those business outcomes sh should be. And for us, you know, it started with uh, a goal to be better innovators. And, uh, you know, IBM has led the patent and trademark filings in the U.S. for 23 years now, I think. Um, and we keep setting records every year. So, you know, if we can drive more innovation into the market, then, you know, we're being successful at, at our goal, which was around driving innovation. Very cool. Well, thank you again, Ed, for taking your time and, and sharing with us. And uh, we look forward to continuing to read what you have to write and, and uh, hearing more great stories uh, great. from you and from IBM. Right, Thanks cool. so much. All right, Kelly, thank you. This podcast was brought to you by Bigger Brains, online training that won't bore you to tears. Expand the minds of your workforce at getbiggerbrains.com. Thanks for tuning in to Permission to Speak. If you want to increase collaboration and innovation in your organization, check out more resources available at speakingpractically.com or give me a call, Kelly Vandiver, at 770-597-1108.